Welcome to our course, Boltzmann Law, Physics to Computing. Now, this is a, just a short overview to tell you about what we'll be doing the next five weeks. Now, the course broadly has these three segments. See, we start with statistical mechanics, go on to a topic that you might see in a course on machine learning, and then on to some topics that you might see in quantum computing. And you might be wonder, wondering that, you know, that's quite a spectrum of topics. Uh, what's common and what's the connection of, between all this? Well, let me try to explain. Now, statistical mechanics, you see, is a subject that started back in the 19th century when people were trying to develop this atomistic view of matter. Right? And they were trying to understand the macroscopic properties in terms of the chaotic motion of the atoms. And in that context, there were all these seminal concepts that were developed. And we'll touch on three of these in this first week of the course, the Boltzmann law, the concept of entropy, and free energy. Okay. But we'll try to introduce all this in a context that you may have seen before, something that you'd have seen if you take a course in solid state physics or in solid state devices. The idea that electrons in solids Usually the way you think of it is there are certain allowed energy levels which the electrons can occupy. And what is the probability that a particular level is occupied? Well, that's what's given by the Fermi function. So consider the energy level, wherever that is, this epsilon, relative to this electrochemical potential mu. And you normalize it to the thermal energy kT. K is this Boltzmann's constant and T is the absolute temperature. And this dimensionless quantity x is what enters the Fermi function. And the Fermi function is a number between 0 and 1, an analog number somewhere in there between 0 and 1, which tells you the probability that the state is occupied. So if you're way up here in energy, much higher than the electrochemical potential, then x is a big positive number. And then the, this Fermi function is close to 0. But if you're down here, so that x is a big negative number, then the Fermi function is close to 1. And remember, the Fermi function is like the probability that the state is occupied. Because finally, a state is either occupied or unoccupied. You cannot have half an electron. What you can have is zero electrons for half the time and one electron for another half. Okay? And that's how you should think of this Fermi function. Now, this way of describing the occupation of levels, you know, works is exact if the electrons were non-interacting things. But in practice, as you know, electrons are, of course, interacting through their, just the Coulomb interaction even. And if you want to include interactions into your description, then more correctly, you should think in terms of the collective states of the system. And that's one of the concepts we introduce right away as we get into this course, this concept of a state space. So what's the state space? The idea is that you see any energy level can be either full, which is one, or empty, which is zero. And that's true of each one of those levels. Another level, again, that can be zero or one. So when you try to describe the states of the entire system, you could write them as like a binary number. See, so 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, meaning first state is full, the second state is empty, third state's empty, fourth state's full, and so on. So how many states are there in state space? Well, if there are n levels, then there will be 2 to the power n states, right? Because each level has two possibilities. And so n of them have 2 to the power n possibilities. And the Boltzmann law, which is the general law of obeyed by all systems in equilibrium, is that the probability that the system will be in a given state i is given by this function. And this law is really in this 2 to the n space. So one important point I wanted to stress is the dis distinction between the n space and the 2 to the n space. See? Now, and this is important because, you see, as n increases, this 2 to the n increases exponentially. So if you had 10 levels, 
there would be like a th about a thousand configurations. 20 levels, a million. 40 levels, a trillion. So it goes up in a hurry. So you might say, well, then how do we ever actually calculate something? Because that seems like a lot of possibilities to account for and do calculations on. And that's where, I guess, what, has developed, what is widely used, and you have seen this if you are taking a course on like solid state devices, or if you are doing atomic structure calculations, whatever it is, you'd have used some version of this. And that's this self-consistent field method. So the idea is that when you have non-interacting electrons, the way you calculate the occupation is by considering this quantity and finding its Fermi function. In the self-consistent field method, the way you think is every energy level is kind of affected by the interaction with the other electrons. And that's described by this term. So if a level Q is occupied, then it g gives rise to a potential in the Rth level and causes the Rth level to float up. And then you apply the Fermi function to, the, to this modified level. So that's how this self-consistent field method works. And we'll talk about it in week one of the course. At the end of week one, we'll introduce this method. And this method, you see, can be used to do what you might call a sampling scheme. And that is that you could, say, generate one configuration after another using this to generate the next sample. So idea is, I've got one sample. Now the way I generate the next sample is, I use f as the probability of being a one. So according to that probability, I check, select if it's zero or one. And in this way, I can create an entire sequence at, or in time sequence of samples of different states, you know, one, zero, zero, one, one, and then zero, zero, one, 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 etc. We can go through it. And they will have the correct Boltzmann distribution if you generate them in the right way. And these are things we'll talk about, how you do this sampling. But the important point is that this sampling approach, you see, allows you to work in the n space. Because after all, this index r, that runs over all the levels, which means it runs so it has n possible values. So if you have 40 levels, it has, there are 40 terms here but not two to the 40, which would be a trillion and unmanageable. And this is the approach that, as I say, widely used in physics and statistical mechanics, the sampling method. And now in machine learning, what we have is a kind of a change in perspective. That is, when you're doing physics or statistical mechanics, the idea is that nature has given us a system with certain energy levels which are reflected in the X and certain interactions which are reflected in the U. And our job is to mo model it. And so we have this sampling method. We could use it to model that response. But in machine learning, the approach is different. Or when you're trying to develop applications, different types of applications, machine learning is one of them. Other applications are possible, as we'll discuss. Here it is like, the, depending on the problem you solve, you actually want a certain distribution in the two to the n space. And what you have to figure out is what x and u will get you there. So x and u are not given by nature. You design it so that they solve the problem for you. So the problem is solved in two to the n space, but you design these things in, x, in this n space, which allows you to implement, essentially engineer any type of interaction you want by choosing the, this u and the x. Now, of course, once you get, take that attitude, it is like you're not really solving a particular physical problem anymore. And so how you represent it is also then a matter of choice. Because if you're going to do these things in software, like by writing codes, then it's really, uh, these are just symbols that, that determine the behavior of a collection of these binary objects. And that each one of those units kind of has these two states, zero and one. Now we introduced it by saying that, well, it's like an energy level that is full or empty. But you could have other physical entities also which behave that way, which have binary states. And 
unless you are trying to build a hardware that does it, it really doesn't matter what physical picture you carry in mind. Mathematically, it's really just a unit with binary states. So for example, if you're representing this in CMOS technology, you might have these two transistors, one is off and one is on. And if this is off and this is on, then this voltage is low, that might be your zero. Whereas this is on and this is off, this voltage would be high and that could be your one. Another possibility is if you can think in terms of magnets. You know, a magnet pointing up could be your zero, magnet pointing down, you know, with the south pole and north pole arranged this way could be your, so one is zero, the other is one, see? And this, this one is actually nice because you could kind of call that a classical spin, you know, one that is, can point up or down, plus one or minus one. And this is the one that naturally goes over into the quantum spins that we'll be talking about. So in general, then the point I wanted to make is that we will start the courses with concepts of statistical mechanics, end with the self-consistent field, and then introduce sampling. And then we'll talk about these different applications. You see optimization, inference, learning, and how you do these sampling methods, you see, in this, to treat, to obtain results in the two to the power of n space, right? And by designing these interactions in the n space. Now, we then go on to discuss how those classical spins concepts can be translated into the quantum spins. Because you see, uh, quantum spins, what is a quantum spin? Well, actually, an electron itself is like a little magnet. You know, everyone's familiar with the charge of the electron, but actually it also has a magnetic moment. So it's actually, each one is like a little magnet, but it's a quantum magnet. And what experiments have shown is that it's a very strange kind of magnet in the sense that it can point in any direction. But if you try to measure it in a particular direction, you'll get only two values, you know, plus one and minus one, as if it's a classical little magnet with a special axis. It's just that it's got no special axis. You could be measuring in any direction you want. And this, these are of course experimental facts and to describe it, you need a somewhat different kind of math, which is what we introduce in the fourth week. And we'll talk about these quantum, math, quantum spins. And the important question is, that when you have quantum systems, can you still use sampling to calculate the answers in two to the n space? Because remember, in the classical case, what allows us to do problems in, allows us to do big problems is that we can use this sampling method. Question is, can you do that in quantum systems? And that's what we'll talk about in the last week when we talk about different quantum algorithms. And we'll try to, we'll try to explain why it is why sampling, I mean, can be used, but there are difficulties. And in a way, the basic rationale, why people think it is really important and useful to build quantum hardware or qubits or quantum computers, is that there is no simple sampling method. And so you only way to be solving big problems in this quantum thing would be if you had a quantum computer that naturally mimicked the, what you are trying to do. Whereas if you try to calculate it by sampling, you run into certain difficulties. So that's what I'll try to convey in the last week of the course. Well, so that's really a quick outline of what we have put together for you for the next five weeks and hope you enjoy it. Thank you.